Yes, hello and uh, welcome everyone to the final virtual Brain and Mind seminar um, from this week. So my name is Boris Bernhardt and I co-organized this lecture with Nathan Spreng, Bratislav Music, and the Neuro Events and Neuromedia teams. And before we get started, I would like to ask every one of you to please mute your microphone and to keep your cameras off so that we don't interfere with the talk. And we'll have a formal question answer period after the talk where you can ask your questions directly or put them in the chat and we'll read them to the speaker. Thank you. So um, as you know, our weekly lecture features both early career investigators as well as established scientists and we try to cover a broad range of methods and techniques that we use at the MNI and elsewhere. And if you want to propose a speaker to us, uh, please do so. We already have the schedule full for the fall, but um, starting 2021, uh, we have a few slots to fill. So please reach out to us and propose some speakers you'd like to hear. So for, for today, I'm like very pleased so that Katie Chang could um, uh, agree to give a talk. And Katie is assistant prof at the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at Vanderbilt University in uh, Nashville, Tennessee. And she received her, P her PhD in electrical engineering at Stanford University and did postdoctoral studies at the intramural uh, research program of the NIH. And since 2018, she has been prof at Vanderbilt. And in her lab, she seeks to advance the understanding of human brain function by developing techniques for both the analysis and the interpretation of neuroimaging data. Katie, thank you so much for agreeing to give the talk. I'm really looking forward to this and please take it away. Thank you. Thank you so much for the, for the introduction for inviting me. Um, so I will try to share my screen now. Um, let's see. Perfect. Great. Is that working? Okay, great. Um, yeah, and, and, and hi everyone out there. Thank you so much for coming. So um, today I'm planning to discuss some of our studies on trying to link fMRI dynamics and internal states of the brain and body. 
So um, as a brief introduction, um, for the last couple of decades, as, as most of you are probably familiar, there's been a strong focus on using fMRI, not only for measuring how the brain responds to the external world and external stimuli, but also to observe our natural intrinsic brain activity, um, often studied in the resting state, you know, when your subject's not performing any particular task. And the reason that this has been um, really heavily studied uh, is that if we look at how regions of the brain are synchronized uh, in their spontaneous activity, we can see really interesting spatial structure, such as large scale correlated networks, um, even down to layer dependent correlations. Now, um, in addition to focusing on the spatial structure of our data, one of the things that I've been really interested in is to try and see what more information we can gain if we look um, at the temporal features and dynamics of these signals. So for example, um, instead of making a single map of activity or connectivity on average across a scan, what if we try to look more explicitly at the patterns that are unfolding over time and see if that tells us more about like, how different networks are interacting um, or if we can learn more about natural state changes like alertness or attention, um, and also whether features extracted from the dynamics of these signals can provide useful biomarkers. Um, and so these types of questions have led to many uh, different kinds of analyses in the field for, um, for approaching fMRI data in this way. And so this is just a, a sampling of work from a number of different groups. So for example, one thing we might do is uh, track how signals or how correlations um, are changing over time, such as by looking at it shorter time windows of data. Um, or um, here we looked at the coherence between uh, pairs of regions or networks using a time frequency analysis to try to visualize how areas are coupling and decoupling over time and also across different time scales. Um, and we can compute different features on the outputs of these methods. So like one feature that's been studied in uh, several different uh, papers so far is how much time a person's brain uh, dwells in a particular pattern or configuration of connectivity and maybe and whether that's linked with clinical variables or patient populations. For example, um, does the hippocampus spend more time connected to certain other regions um, in patients versus controls? Um, oops, there we go. Um, and so, so we can start to probe these dynamics and see really interesting uh, signal patterns um, when we explore the data like this. But at the same time, there are, are still a lot, lot of unanswered questions in, about what exactly these moment-to-moment -moment signal changes mean. So um, in other words, what are the sorts of neural and physiological sources or processes that are shaping the dynamics we observe at any given moment? Um, it's hard to tell just looking at the data what, what functional states a person might be you know, experiencing um, or even what part of the signal is neural versus non-neural. And so um, today I wanted to describe work that tries to probe these dynamics by combining fMRI with complementary measurements, including EEG and physiological signals. And the goal is um, to see if, the, see if this can help us better understand our data, as well as gain even more information from fMRI about the brain and body. And, and so first I'm gonna start discussing studies on um, vigilance or alertness. Um, I may use those terms interchangeably, although I know that there's distinctions in how they're used in the literature. Um, and that's gonna be done using combined EEG, fMRI, and then discuss uh, cardiac and respiratory activity. So if you've been a subject for an fMRI scan, you probably know that it can be easy to fall asleep when you're in the scanner, actually even, even though it's very loud in there and even when you're supposed to be focusing on a task. Um, personally, I can only ever take naps during the day if I'm in a scanner. Uh, I don't know why, but that, that's true. Um, and so it's, it, it, it's like, it, this is actually quite important to consider for fMRI studies, I think, because first of all, um, how alert we are has an influence on our behavior and um, how we process information. Um, and it may also shape the bold signal dynamics that we see. And so, um, so there's reason to believe that it may impact bold signals in a widespread fashion. So changes in vigilance are regulated by interactions between cortical areas and widely projecting subcortical regions. Um, and empirically, this does seem to be the case. So several studies have shown that um, if you look at functional connectivity and fMRI signal amplitude, um, that these are altered as a function of vigilant states, um, specifically with drowsier states um, being linked with more uh, global signals and connectivity, as well as 
higher amplitude bowl fluctuations. And this is shown in a, in a really long scan when somebody um, fell asleep. So one thing that we might hypothesize is that even within the course of a single scan, say your 10 minutes that your subject is in there, um, there may be natural changes in vigilance levels that may manifest um, in changes in correlation maps or signals over time. And so this is one of our early studies on that. So we simultaneously recorded EEG and fMRI. And um, that's because EEG can give us an indicator of someone's levels of alertness, um, for instance, by looking at the alpha and beta band uh, power. Um, and if we took like, this is like a 10 minute scan, if we break that into 40 second sliding windows of data over time, um, we found that windows of time where the person was more likely drowsy, according to the EEG, that this came with more widespread uh, positive correlations between the default mode and dorsal attention networks um, compared to the, when the subject was more likely alert, um, where we saw weaker correlations and more anti-correlations. Um, and when I started to, to look at these things, I, I got kind of excited that, that we could see something that correlated with the EEG because it, would, it suggests that um, when we're looking at these fMRI dynamics, it's not all just noise. We may be able to detect some real neural state changes, such as vigilance, um, that may have this correlate in the EEG. Um, and another reason that I thought this could be interesting is, is it means that our fMRI dynamics themselves may give us a kind of window into the internal state of a person. So maybe it's possible to look at some features of our fMRI signals, even if we don't have EEG, and try to tell what kind of uh, vigilant state the person was in. And so that was, in fact, examined by another group around this time. So here they showed that it's maybe possible to do sleep staging based on the fMRI data. Um, if you train a classifier on, on the sliding window correlation patterns in fMRI. So up here, what they show is fMRI-based sleep staging. So they're, they're trying to classify um, the, at each time or, or each sliding window into one of five discrete states. Um, and at the bottom here is the EEG gold standard um, sleep staging. So along these lines, um, we were interested in whether it's possible to detect more continuous fluctuations in alertness, like you might see in this EEG time course here. So something more on the spectrum between alertness on the one hand and drowsiness or light sleep on the other. Um, and we were also interested in getting an alertness measure for every TR rather than in, um, in sliding window chunks of data. And so basically what we asked is, if we have our fMRI scan, if, we, if someone gives us an fMRI scan and we've not recorded any EEG or other measure of what the person's alertness may be, is it possible to just take that scan and look at something in the dynamics and come up with a whole time course of moment to moment changes in alertness? So that was the goal here. Um, and there's a few reasons we, why you know, this might be useful. Um, one is that many existing data sets don't have any vigilance measures. And so if we can read that off based on the fMRI data, then maybe we can use it like in our statistical analyses to model brain states um, or look at how the states interact with behavioral or cognitive variability. And so the approach that we started with um, is we extracted um, a continuous EEG alertness index, so like, like this. And we used it to map which fMRI voxels show positive or negative responses to changes in alertness. So the maps tended to look something like this. Um, this is for one example subject, but many of them showed similar patterns where you get um, negative weights in much of the cortex and um, fewer um, uh, but more focal positive correlations like in, in thalamus and other subcortical regions, um, which is consistent with a lot of literature in, in the field. Um, and so just to interpret this a little more, like negative voxels here means that these areas show a decrease in their bold response when the level of alertness increases and vice versa for positive. So um, given such a pattern, we wondered, can we go the other way around? And um, if someone gives you a new fMRI data set, can, can we use this somehow to extract an alertness time course without looking at an EEG? And so to do that step, um, what we proposed is that if we have such a spatial map, maybe we've learned it from a set of data that have multimodal, like, you know, EEG fMRI recordings. Um, if someone gives us a new scan, where these are like the volumes across that scan, um, what we could do is maybe project this spatial template pattern onto each successive volume of that new scan. And this would trace out a time course that we would take to be our fMRI estimate of a person's alertness over time. 
And importantly, in this approach, we get a value for every TR in the scan. So we're not using sliding window correlations of, in this approach. Um, and so if, if we do this, then we, we actually want to know if it's working, <laughs> like if it produces a good measure of alertness. And so what we can do is we can take scans that did have some kind of independent measure of alertness available, like the EEG or the behavior, and we can use that to evaluate how well our estimate does. Um, and we were first happened to be looking at this in monkeys. That's just because I happened to be doing some studies where we were scanning monkeys, and um, we had video of the monkey's face during the scan. So we could, that, those videos were very um, like telling. We could really see when they were becoming sleepy. So they'd be, they'd be struggling to keep their eyes open for a while, and then you could see they just lose that battle and close their eyes. So that seemed to be a pretty good index of their sleepiness. Um, and so if we were to compare our measure um, with the actual eye opening and closing behavior that was happening spontaneously in that monkey, then in, in a number of scans, we did, it did a pretty good job of telling when the monkey probably had its eyes open versus closed um, during the scan. Now, the monkeys also had electrophysiological signal recorded um, at the same time. So we could also use an EEG-like measure as another independent validation. Um, so if we did that um, and we quantified the correlations between our fMRI-based alertness measure and an electrophysiological index of alertness, then we found that um, it correlated with that um, as about the same level if we looked at stretches of data when the monkey just had un like had its eyes opening or closing at, you know, on, uh, uh, during the time, or if we isolated sections of the data where the monkey kept their eyes closed the, the whole time, just so that we want to see if it's actually something that's not just related to the behavior of opening and closing your eyes. And so that was in monkeys. So what about in humans? Well, um, Sarah Goodale is an awesome grad student in my lab who's been working on this approach with human subjects. And um, here are a few scans, or a few results um, from her analysis. Yeah, there you go. So um, what you see here are three different scans. Um, and in red are the estimated fluctuations in alertness based on um, that template um, projection method I showed. Um, so we got them independently of the EEG. And then um, in blue here are the actual measured levels from the EEG that we overlaid for comparison. Um, and I showed two scans here that did really well, so it's great. <laughs> but then, of course, not all scans um, did, did, did that well. And uh, uh, I think that is also really interesting because we want to know what's different there. Um, do we just have noisier data? Is something else going on? And so we're looking more carefully at those situations to try to understand and maybe improve the method. Um, but in addition to um, looking at whether we can track an EEG-based measure of alertness, we also wondered if our measure could be useful for if you have a task and you're looking at um, capturing behavioral response variability. So, um, so we know that um, even if a person is presented with the same stimulus over and over, um, your response to the stimulus can still differ over time. And some of that variability might arise from how alert the person is. And there's many other factors, but one, one factor may be how, alertness, uh, how alert you are when, when, you receive, when the stimulus is, is coming in. And so we were interested in whether we could use that alertness index to try to predict how a person will respond to an upcoming stimulus. Um, so in this study, we presented the same auditory tone um, throughout the scan, um, but at pretty large intervals. So the trial didn't really overlap too much in their hemodynamic response and a little bit and with a little bit of randomness as well. And what we did is say, say like, can we take a, a small interval before each stimulus, like five seconds? Um, and if we calculate our fMRI alertness index in that window, will that relate to the subject's upcoming response? Like, did they respond? Did they not respond? Or how fast um, was the reaction time? And so um, here are some results. So each subject corresponds to one of these pairs of dots. And so if we look at um, the hits, the trials where we responded or trials where they didn't respond, we find that the trials when they did respond were linked with a higher estimated alertness from our fRI metric um, based on or uh, compared to trials where they missed it for, for most of the subjects. 
um, suggesting that it may be promising that we capture the uh, within subject variability um, in reaction times, or sorry, in, in reactions. And another thing that we can do is um, we can actually try to zoom in like around uh, the onset of, of the retrial at what the alertness measure looks like um, for both the hits and the misses. And so this is like a basically an event locked response, but of our fMRI alertness measure. Um, at time zero is when the tone was presented and we averaged separately for trials that had responses versus those that didn't have responses. Um, and interestingly, like, you know, like, I guess, well, first of all, focusing on the pre-stimulus interval, we can indeed see that the, the estimated alertness is higher for trials with hits compared to those with misses. Um, but also for the trials with hits, we saw this little bump um, in the alertness index after, after the trial. And we thought that maybe this comes from the tone actually waking someone up a, a little more, like maybe there's a transient increase in alertness. Um, and because this is fMRI, then if an alertness change happens around time zero, then we would see it with some hemodynamic delay. And so to verify that, um, we actually looked at the EEG data that we had simultaneously recorded, um, which captures the neural timing more closely. And so if we look at an EEG spectrogram, um, around when the tone was presented, then we could see that for the trials with hits, we did see an increase in the alpha power, um, indicating maybe a bit of an increase in alertness, um, and only for the hits, not for not for the trials where they missed. Um, and so we're excited about the potential to try to be able to infer someone's, like to actually infer a functionally uh, or behaviorally relevant states and with um, the, this kind of temporal resolution. Um, and one other result that I'll show is that if we say we take the trials only that had uh, uh, that on, only the trials that had responses, and we try to look at our reaction times, and in this case we just sorted them into fast or slow trials based on the threshold, um, we found that if the faster trials were um, linked with a higher estimated alertness um, in the pre-stimulus interval um, compared to the slower trials, so. Um, yeah, and some subjects only had slow trials. That's why they're just a, a gray dot. So to wrap up this um, part of the talk, um, we see that fluctuations in alertness can influence our fMRI signals and connectivity, but also that their signatures in the fMRI dynamics may be reliable enough for us to decode someone's ongoing levels of alertness from fMRI, um, and that the estimates that we're getting um, can correlate with the trial by trial response variability during the task. And so um, the goal is like, you know, hopefully these methods can provide tools for studying um, vigilant states, especially in a, when you don't have external measures recorded um, and to then probe further how it interacts with um, behavioral variability. So next I'm gonna talk about um, recording peripheral physiological signals, specifically cardiac and respiration data. Um, and this is another important factor when looking at fMRI dynamics. Um, when I was in my PhD and starting to look at sliding window correlations and various aspects of how, how uh, fMRI signals change over time, um, one of the things that jumped out at me is that um, sometimes you get these epochs of like very high correlation across the brain. Um, and because we were recording physiological data, like how the person is breathing over time, we could see that some of those events corresponded with when the person was taking a deep breath. And so um, as a little background for what might be going on, um, it's been known for quite some time that breathing changes the fold signal. Um, so if you take a really deep breath, for instance, um, well, actually, if you, yeah, if you take a breath, like this changes the oxygenation state of the brain, um, can have an influence on our, our hemodynamic signals. And so um, in this um, work, they did a rather extreme breathing manipulation. So um, you can look at the time scale here. This is, this is not each breath. This is actually they had people hold their breath for some um, part of the uh, for for a longer period of time, and um, this induces large uh, bold signal changes over the scan um, and over over much of the uh, brain, so the vascularized tissue. And one of the potential contributing mechanisms is that breathing impacts the uh, carbon dioxide concentration in, in our blood, which um, is a vasodilator and will trigger increases in cerebral blood flow. 
Um, and so that was for a, you know, a, a more like a breathing challenge, but we can also see this effect come about due to natural changes in breathing that happen over a scan. So if uh, this is the person's uh, breathing belts data in red, and it has a, a power that spectrum, you know, peak at the breathing frequency. Um, what the effect that we're going to focus on here is the slower envelope of breathing changes, um, which you can see has a lower frequency power spectrum that, in fact, totally overlaps with the interesting spectrum bold uh, fMRI signals, or, or like much of it at, the, at least. And so um, this was, of course, going to be really important for studying um, fMRI dynamics. Um, especially in, um, in resting state where it may be harder to tell what component of your signals are of, of interest versus those maybe that may be driven um, only by physiology. Um, and these lower frequency effects are also tricky to handle in, in popular denoising methods like ICA. So here I just took a random um, subject from the human connectome data that had undergone six denoising, so that's a very thorough ICA-based pipeline, which is very good for handling um, many nuisance effects. But um, when it comes to the low-frequency physiology, we still see that a substantial portion of variance in the data can be accounted for by low-frequency respiratory and uh, volume and heart rate changes. Um, and then it, from the standpoint of connectivity, we can do a similar thing. So if we take pairwise correlations between uh, gray matter atlas regions, um, we find that we can get a lot of, uh, in, like, higher connectivity um, induced by uh, correlated changes in, in physiology um, that can be reduced if we regress out um, rest these low frequency effects. And so um, how do we model these effects in our data? Like how, how would we come up with regressors for that, for example? Um, one of the, the directions that we've been focusing on to try to figure that out involves um, trying to monitor the cardiac and respiratory activity during fMRI and then um, trying to estimate transfer functions or response functions for how these effects propagate into our bold signals. So in other words, just like we may need to convolve um, our task design with a, a, a neural or, or, or like with a hemodynamic response in HRF, um, we may need uh, response functions for cardiac and respiratory signals as well to capture how these map into the bold fMRI data. Um, and so this was some of our work um, on this. And uh, there's actually some really nice recent work from a group at MNI using much larger set of subjects from the, from the HCP data um, and looking at getting more robust transfer functions and, and looking at more deeply how these vary across participants, um, for, um, for example. So um, I guess a goal here is that if we have models that can map between um, major, measured physiological signals and fMRI, then that can help us to, um, to resolve the influences, to disentangle certain parts of the signal that um, are being driven by those effects, and perhaps in a more targeted manner than using something like global signal regression, which um, has an unknown a global signal as an unknown mixture of artifact and neural activity, the balance of which can change um, from scan to scan. So um, when, uh, one thing we can also do is look at the, the shapes of these response functions. Um, these here were uh, kind of like an average response if we look what's happening across the brain um, on average. But we might also suspect that they differ across different brain regions. Um, and this was, this was a collaboration um, by, uh, led by Jing Yan Chen, who's a postdoc at MGH in John Paul Minnie's lab. And um, what she found was that if we deconvolve these response functions, um, so these are what you convolve our RV signal with to get an fMRI, um, if we deconvolve those from every voxel in the brain um, and then try to cluster voxels that share similar dynamics, then the clusters that you get actually follow pretty organized spatial patterns. Um, they actually show some divisions that look quite a lot like resting state networks. So um, this was for if you do a clustering and ask for two clusters, um, we can also ask for more clusters to try to continue to resolve uh, different spatial patterns that, that differentiate in their physiological dynamics. Um, and so I think that one thing this, I, or I guess one more important part is that like these were reliable um, across different uh, participants. So if you take a, you average those 
dynamics from 95 subjects and then you do the same thing on another 95, then that's what these um, solid and dotted lines were uh, corresponding to. So it suggests that there may be um, reliable signatures that happen you know, in, in response to breathing, that these may differ across the brain um, and may not also be captured in a single global regressor. And um, I think another interesting question that opened up was like, to what extent are canonical resting state networks are being driven by correlated physiological responses. And I think that there's plenty of evidence that they're not just vascular right now. I mean, there's there's a lot of evidence that they have a neural origin as well, but maybe there is somewhat of, of both components present. So maybe there is a, a, a neural component and um, vascular um, responses also show that symmetry, which is maybe very interesting and, and beneficial to have a, to the brain to have some kind of alignment between the vascular and neuronal networks. Um, that was also pointed out in, in this recent paper. Um, and so I guess one of the things, one of the issues, like if we want to study physiology um, in fMRI, then it's been really important for us to have high quality physiological signals um, recorded from a person. Um, but we know that that's not always the case. Um, first of all, a lot of scans don't have physiological signals recorded and or when they are, sometimes they're not of sufficient quality. So you may have like this clipping going on or just weird things happening that are probably not physiological. Um, it can be really time consuming to, to try to clean them up or to try to sort them to get just to figure out which ones you can use and which ones not. So that can be a, a deterrent to using physiology um, in our analyses. Um, so that motivated one of the questions that we asked here, which is, um, if you, is it possible to get uh, physiological signals from the fMRI data alone, um, kind of similar in, in principle to what we did with the vigilance levels, um, so that if you have scans that don't have physio or they don't have um, clean physio, then maybe we can still derive physiological information that we can use. So several previous studies have, have uh, attempted to reconstruct uh, physiological waveforms from fMRI. Um, many of them have focused on the timing of every breath or the timing of every heartbeat that's happening um, and usually using some kind of um, leveraging the like subsampling or uh, sub-second um, fast uh, fMRI or like looking at actually the slice timings to try to reconstruct those. Um, the problem that we focused on here was not to get the, the exact respiratory signal or cardiac signal, but just the, the low frequency changes like in RV and heart rate um, that, uh, that we saw had, had strong correlations with fMRI. So um, this might be easier to do if you have um, data that have longer TRs. Um, and so this is work led by um, uh, Jorge and Rosa in my lab. And so um, we, what we did here was uh, we, we compared um, uh, two different models. So um, in, in this paper, which, which is uh, just recent, um, recently came out, or not yet out, I guess. We just heard it was accepted. But um, so we looked at a, a five-layer convolutional neural network. This is like a more complex model. Um, and we also looked at a single unit um, model with no nonlinearities. So it's basically just a linear network. Um, and for the study, we used scans from the Human Connectome Project. These are selected based on the quality of the physiological data. And um, we, because we were also tried, interested in seeing if we can make this work on more slowly sampled data, um, we took the HCP data, which is a 0.72 TR, and we filtered in and downsampled that by a factor of two. Um, uh, and we used, um, we, we compared some atlases, but mainly used this 90 ROI atlas um, from, from Fine Lab here. Um, and, and there's more details about the method, I guess, in the, in the, in the paper, but like one of the, one of the things that, one of the important um, points about how this particular model um, operated was that we, we did this in a somewhat of a sliding window fashion. So um, we used a chunk of data, um, of input fold signal data, um, and we use that to predict the center point of the RV um, estimate. And then we would just slide that over by one window at a time so that we can build the whole um, RV signal. It's like adaptable to different lengths of data as well. Um, and so just to show some of the results that we have, um, there, these are three different scans that were selected based on their goodness of the measured or, or a goodness of prediction. So the top one is a really good one. Um, the green 
um, waveform is the measured uh, respiration signal and the, um, the orange is the reconstructed one, in this case from the convolutional neural network. This was for a good one. Um, and these, this was a medium case and, and not great uh, prediction. So there's a, there's, a, there's a range that we see. Um, and in terms of all the scans, you know, what is the summary statistics of that performance? So um, if we, our, our performance metric, by the way, was the Pearson correlation, temporal correlation between the um, actual and measured um, waveforms. And so um, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll point out a couple of um, observations in this figure. So first of all, we, uh, the, these two colors represent the different methods we use, so the CNN or the single unit network. And one of the things that we were kind of surprised about is that they, they performed very similarly to one another. So even though the single unit model has many fewer parameters um, and is essentially a linear deconvolution the way we're setting that up, um, although with a 2D kind of input, um, then we, uh, we yeah, the, the performance was quite similar. So that was interesting to us. Um, we also looked at three different pre-processing strategies for the HCP data. So we looked at the fixed data um, and the minimally pre-processed data. Um, and we, we compared the minimally pre-processed version of the data with and without projecting out head motion parameters, since head motion is um, known to, that may correlate with respiration in some ways. So we might get actually information that helps us predict. Um, and so the one that did slightly better was the minimally pre-processed data. So maybe some of the residual head motion in there and other things um, can actually help toward predicting um, respiration. Um, and so, yeah, this was just a kind of scan by scan comparison of the performance of the fixed corrected uh, data and the minimally pre-processed -pre uh, data. So that's the identity line. So they, they were better for the minimal pre-processed data. Um, and then finally, we looked at uh, spatial maps of the um, percent variance explained by the predicted and measured um, signals. And these are just averaged over all of the scans. Um, they have a pretty similar pattern. And, um, but one kind of thing that we noticed is that you, you actually see more variance explained by the predicted um, than the measured RV signal. And um, I guess there's, there's maybe a couple of things we might speculate on that, uh, what, why that might be. Um, one possibility is because we were using fMRI data to extract this measure, so maybe that's actually, you know, that's 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 one reason that we're, we're it's core, the end the end result correlates better. But um, but also, I guess an, an, an optimistic one too is that maybe the RV signal that we're generating, because it's trained on the number of scans, maybe it can help give us a a, a, a less noisy version than what we're getting from the measured RV. Um, but yeah, just just uh, this is thinking there, but um, I guess what this is below here is just the scan by scan comparison. So these are like all the 138 scans, and we looked at like within a particular region of interest, how much variance was explained by the predicted and the measured um, RV signal. And so to summarize this part, um, we. Uh, we think that like disentangling the physiological responses or physiological effects in fMRI can help to improve our interpretation and lead us to clear inferences. Um, and we can, we may be able to extract these low frequency variations from fMRI alone, um, which may help us provide physiological information to a lot of existing data that may not have um, RV measured or future scans that lack um, clean respiratory recordings. Um, and that I think that that it could be useful not just thinking about physio physiology in terms of it being a compound, but also in terms of useful things we want to study about the brain and about brain states and brain body interactions, since the physiology relates very closely to those things. In fact, there's very close relationships between this physiological effects and vigilance, tying back to the earlier parts of the talk. I didn't really get to go into that today, but I think that there's that's a whole interesting topic of its own. Um, and so to, to conclude, um, I think that these dynamics of our signals are really rich. They, they show definitely a lot of interesting patterns um, and that we may be able and, and uh, we may be able to extract information about the vigilant states and physiology from these signals. Um, and I think that if we can understand these signals better and, um, and disentangle various parts of them that may, may help us to advance the development of fMRI biomarkers as well as um, our understanding of brain states. 
And so I want to thank my um, awesome lab and colleagues. Um, yeah, we are the Nerdy Lab. At, that's our short name for Neuroimaging and Brain Dynamics Lab. So, um, and thanks to all of you for, for joining and look forward to discussing any, any questions you may have. Yes, thank you very much, Katie. That was a great talk. So we now have time for question and answer and discussion. So um, members of the audience, you can ask a question directly or you can type it in the chat. Perhaps while we're waiting for the first question, I have, you know, like one question that I could ask is when you were talking about the work uh, to reconstruct physiological waveforms from uh, bold fMRI, that was like really cool work. Is there some interregional variability in the amount of error that you get? Maybe I missed this. Maybe you mentioned this, but are the yeah. are, are like some regions better predictors than others? Yeah. Some. So um, the regions that tend to to be better predictors, at least. So I can say um, that uh, for the um, for the linear model. Um, we could more easily go and look at the weights of that model and see which regions might be um, contributing more. I guess it's always complex, but we we did that. And when we when we do that, um, we see that um, the areas that tend to correlate with RV more on average uh, tend to have the highest um, weights too. So um, areas like the sensory motor cortex or the visual cortex have really high weights in the data. Um, mm -hmm. So those those tended to um, to show up. Uh, really strongly in their weights as well. Maybe like one follow-up question on this, would you expect that you get better, but that you get even better performance when you would also incorporate like ASL or SWI type data to map vascular territories? That's a really interesting question. Um, yeah, I, I think that that would definitely be worth a look. Yeah, we haven't tried it yet, but that, that's, that's a really cool idea. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, so we have a question from the audience that I, that I will read to you. So thank you for the very interesting talk. So in the first part, uh, I assume this relates to the alertness uh, um, results that you've shown. How did you calculate the evoked response and vigilance in the vigilance analysis? Was it an average across all the voxels in the brain? Um, yeah, so that time course I showed was of our, our estimated vigilance time course. So that was already just a single value at every single time point of what we think the vigilance might be based on the that signal uh, on, on our, our, our met metrics so um, so there was no like I guess a notion of space there so we just um, took those time course so every scan is associated with one like one dimensional time course and we just like looked at um, work you know one vector and we so we just looked at like um, average chunks of those around the, the data. Yeah, thanks. So another follow up question from Casey is, uh, thanks for the great talk, Katie. I wondered if you could break down the spatial pattern of the respiration volume signals more. It looked to explain more variance in sensory areas. What would explain this? So that's such an interesting question because I always noticed that there is very high variance in these areas. Um, if anyone in the audience has more idea why it has the spatial distribution, I'd be really curious, except maybe they're vascularized, uh, they're like, a, has to do with the vasculature of these regions. Um, uh, so it's, yeah, we see this in, in multiple studies. So um, that's, that's a good question. Um, we did this more from a data-driven standpoint. So, but it did seem to um, look to explain more variance in also the areas that contributed to the prediction. Um, does it vary across the type of task? That is a very good question. So this is, um, we are we're now looking at that actually because this was done in the resting state only. So now we're wondering like how that interacts with tasks in terms of like how it influences prediction and, and what we can do there. I mean, you know, like one question for the um, for the first uh, pattern of the of of the talk where you talked about the anti-correlation and the alertness and. You know, many people they are like nowadays interested in these large scale gradients. Would you also expect that these gradients uh, reconfigure as a function of alertness? For example, when you do EG fMRI and you have like the alpha to theta ratio, have you looked into that? How the gradients change? Are they like less decoupled or more decoupled at different states? 
Wow, yeah, that that's really interesting. We haven't done that, no, but I think that's a that's a really cool idea. That's yeah. I, I I'm not sure what I would predict there in terms of what that. Do you do you do you have an uh, idea what? It, so, so no, I, I just got curious because at one point you mentioned that the default mode is more correlated to the DAN at low alertness, if I remember this correctly. So perhaps there the gradient is less deep, but I don't know whether this is a oh, yeah. robust prediction. Yeah, that's that's interesting. Yeah, um, that'd be really interesting to look into. So um, if there are no further questions from the audience. Ah, so there's one, actually. So in conclusion, what would you suggest for dynamic connectivity changes interpretation when no respiratory data is available? Um, yeah, that's, so I think that, um, well, I guess, first of all, if we can try to get this method working well for detecting the respiratory volume, at least hopefully that part of it we can help, we can help with. Um, but I guess just also learning like what the patterns look like um, in terms of respiratory and cardiac effects can help to kind of recognize um, when there might be something happening um, there. So, but that's tricky, I think. Um, yeah, it, it kind of depends what you're trying to quantify as well. Um, so I guess I don't have a great answer to that, but those are some of the <laughs> some thoughts. Yeah, sure. So there's like a question from Robert Satori. So super talk as always. If one is interested in looking at brain activity in different sleep stages, the changes in respiration caused by the different brain states associated with different level of consciousness. In turn, um, breathing itself changes brain activity, as you've shown. So if we remove all the physiology, um, do we remove some signal of interest as well? Yeah, that's a great question. And in fact, that's been like running through my mind day and night about these things, because we actually see uh, a correlated changes in vigilance and physiology. So what do we do? Um, and so like one example that we've been looking at closely like in um, is the K complex. We tend to see uh, at this like at K complex, you see an electrophysiological change and you also see, we have a sympathetic response, autonomic response that results in a like um, a, a large scale brain pattern that's also, we also have a transient respiration and cardiac response and all of these things go together so closely that it's, um, hard to disentangle. Um, I think one thing that may help is that the the temporal dynamics of how they propagate into bold may be a little bit slightly different. So that we, I mean, we're kind of looking at this, but um, that, that may help. Like, so for example, the respiration response function. If you have a change in respiration, then the what you mostly see is a delayed negative response. Um, whereas, and, and the delay is longer than the hemodynamic response delay. So maybe that can actually help us get some separate the, the human neural hemodynamic responses. Um, but yeah, I think, I, yeah, <laughs> the more I, I look at these things, it, it's a big puzzle in terms of how to, to sort these out into, into variants. And that, that indeed, if, what do we do there in terms of regressing things out? Because if we, um, yeah, if we, might, we might very well remove the things that we're interested in along with, the, with other things. And so, um, yeah, thanks for asking that question because I think that that's, I would love, yeah, that, that's something that I've been thinking about a lot. Yeah, very cool. I think, you know, for the, for the alertness uh, levels, maybe also thought patterns could also change as a function of alertness. I'm like not a mind wandering expert or anything, but you know, perhaps if you're more alert, you think more about the future. And if you're less alert, you think more about the past. So there's like always this interrelationship between physiology and mental states. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I mean, there's so ch so much literature on this as well that we 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 didn't I, I didn't unfortunately have time to cover. But like, yeah, so many so many so much interesting literature on that how that modulates activity and also how how these like alertness changes also interact with those um, states and the brain patterns that they're associated with. So there's like two more questions. So uh, the first one is, uh, how can you differentiate changes in the breathing with alertness level? Because uh, alertness level will also change breathing and brain patterns. Yeah, I think that's um, a similar to the question that I just discussed is that like, yeah, um, because they do change and then it comes down to a little bit what their, res their respective signatures are in the data. Um, if we can have some hope there to separate them. Um, 
So yeah, and actually when we were doing this uh, vigilance prediction, we found that if we, if we regress out re physiological effects, that it actually doesn't predict the vigilance quite as well as if we leave them in, which in, in, in retrospect is not that surprising if there's correlated changes that actually can help us give us information about the vigilance states. Yeah, cool. So maybe just to wrap up uh, uh, some technical questions. So uh, like a technical question, how did you acquire uh, the fMRI alertness index in the Goodell paper? Is it similar to the 2016 arousal paper based on pupil dilation? Oh, yeah, so it's slightly, so it's different actually. So we, um, in, the, in the 2016 paper, we were looking at primarily this um, yeah, this eye index. It was more like their their like eyelid <laughs> opening closing, um, and that's because that we had that data for more of the monkeys. So here in in our human studies, we're doing concurrent EEG fMRI, and um, looking at the EEG alpha to beta ratio, um, and so we're using that um, to train and evaluate the models. Um, how do you interpret it, interpret the definition of arousal alertness and attention in your study? I think the EG alertness correlates with uh, frontal parietal network bullet time course. Yeah, and, and, and to be honest, like I've been mixing up these terms a bit in this literature, but also in, in my mind, because um, I, I think that they are interrelated, but also like they are, are, have separate aspects. So we didn't really um, touch like a uh, more the cognitive aspects of these things are more like kind of thinking about it from like wakefulness point of view. But um, so what I really mean to say is um, those are the terms I'm using, but it, what we actually use is the EEG alpha theta time course. So what this reflects in practice um, is I guess what, what it is that we're studying. Um, so yeah, that's... <laughs> Yeah, cool. So maybe last question, is there like a possible interaction in terms of uh, respiration volume and heart rate? Yeah, uh, definitely there is. And there's, um, uh, can be like, that some subjects have more than others to correlated respiration and heart rate. And, um, but we see a lot of um, correlations and we're now like looking more at the, at, at the heart rate as well. So Okay, yeah, so thank you very much, Katie. That was like a wonderful talk and a great discussion. Thanks to the audience also for uh, joining. So um, it was a great big lecture. Um, I'll just make the, if the final announcement. So please register and attend the Open Science and Action Gartner Symposium. And next week's uh, final lecture is done by uh, Josephine uh, Moranzano. Uh, Maranzano, and we'll uh, she'll talk about a novel ex vivo in vivo in situ method to study the human brain through MRI and histology. So thank you all for attending. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, thanks, Katie. That was great.